Well, hello once again, everybody. It is so good to see you. It feels good seeing you guys in church and love to see the room filling up a little bit more as, uh, as restrictions are being lessened and lessened and the days are coming. Yeah. COVID's going to go bye-bye, <laughs> as I used to tell my kids. Oh, we're excited about that. It's so good to see everyone. By the way, my name is Eric Bucci, and I am the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. And if this is your first time watching on home or if you're here, I want to welcome you. I want to thank you so much for coming. And I just want everyone to know that actually the water's pretty warm in here. We'd love to have you come back. We now have Children's Church now in the 10 o'clock and the 11.30. So we're excited about that. But everyone, I want you to let everyone... Hold up. Wait, wait, wait. wait. You're so excited. I love it. It's contagious, right? And East is part of the wonderful children's ministry. So we're so glad to have her back in action. But we want to go ahead. We want to just let everyone know at home how much we love them and we miss them. Because I want you guys to get a lot... I want them to be able to hear it through the camera, even if we don't have a signal. Ready? Welcome, everybody, right now. Go nice and loud. Come on, a little louder, come on. <laughs> All right. Well, it is so good to have you guys here. We're in the middle of a series on First Peter, and what we're talking about is how to handle difficult times. How can you be unshakable when everything around you is shakable? Everything around you is topsy-turvy. Everything else is not going the way you want it. And if you're not careful, you can look at circumstances. You can see what's happening in the culture. You can see what's happening in your family. You can see what's happening with your failures and your children or whoever else, your friends, and you can start getting discouraged and you can start, I can't go on anymore. But you see, this is the truth of the matter. We don't have to be victims of circumstances. We don't have to be some kite in the wind that just flies all around and has no control. No, God wants us to be people that stand on firm ground, and we can. We can be unshakable. And Peter, the apostle of Jesus, who wrote this epistle, epistle, by the way, it's just a fancy word of calling it a letter. So tell somebody, I'm going to send you an e-epistle. They're going to go, you're going to do what? <laughs> you might get in trouble for saying that, okay? That's all it is. And so what he did about uh, 60 to 65 AD, he wrote this to a church that was going under a lot of government persecution. Nero was a crazy emperor that was torturing children. He was beginning to throw them to the lions. He blamed the fire on Rome upon the Christians. The Christians became the scapegoat. All the society's ills were because of the Christians. Now, that doesn't happen today, does it, everybody? No. Aren't you glad it doesn't happen today? It's the same old thing over and over again. So he's writing to the people that are going through a set of circumstances that are very difficult, and he wants to encourage them. And he gives us some secrets how to live our lives. And so I want to encourage you to go back to, uh, by the way, if you have iTunes or Spotify, you can sign up uh, at Cornerstone Cheshire, and you can sign up for our podcast, and this will be thrown to your, not thrown, but it will be delivered to your mailbox every week. And also, you can go to cornerstonecheshire.com, and you can click on and catch up with the series. I'm not going to read re-preach it, but last week we spoke about this. Holiness brings wholeness. And so in this time, we want to be a people that find more wholeness than ever before. So today we're going to be looking at something very interesting. How many are tired? How many like to, uh, how many like babies? I, I love babies, as long as they're not mine, right? I, 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 I love babies and hold them, but once they cry, I don't know about you, I remember the first time... <laughs> Was Luke here? Okay. I remember the first time when we brought Luke home, it was great. We started crying, and he wouldn't stop. I didn't know what to do. And I was at my wit's end, right? I didn't know what to do. And how do you have this stop happening? And then, oh, isn't he cute? He's cute, but you should hear him cry. You should hear him cry, you know? And it was, it was hard. And then the next thing you know, you have two, and then they're crying. And it's like, whoa, it, it can be overwhelming. And, and, and nothing like a baby's cry. You guys don't know what a baby's cry is like. Yeah, it, it will pierce you, right? And so, it, it's, but it's still kind of cute, sort of. But it's not cute when they're 35 years old, still crying in pampers in the basement. That's not cute anymore, right? It's time to grow up. It's time to move on. And un unfortunately, what we see a lot of times is that we, you and I don't always grow up. And we're going to talk about today how to get free. Listen, it's good to grow up. It's good to put on your man pants and your girl pants, girl dress, I guess. I don't know what to call it anymore. If I just offended you by saying that, get over it. Okay, let's move forward. <laughs> Let me just move forward before I get myself into trouble. Okay, everybody, here we go. 
having purified your souls. What we're doing now is we're going back to chapter 1, how it finishes out, because it actually sets us up for chapter 2. Having purified your souls by your obedience. And this is good news, everybody. You know, if you try to put yourself together and get yourself together, it doesn't really work. But if you listen to the instructions of God, it works. God's word works. You do what he says, and you believe what he says, not as an act of his acceptance, because he accepts you through Christ, but as an act of trust, if you do what God says, what the Bible says, you will purify yourself if you're doing it because you want to know him, not just to do the letter of the law. For example, the little boy, they said, sit down, Johnny. And Johnny said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Well, now, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a submissive spirit. So having purified your souls by your obedience... To the truth for sincerely, sincere brotherly love. You see, how do we grow up? We grow up together. We grow up listening to the word of the Lord, and we help each other out. We help each other build. I, I like my, my uncles all came back from World War II. Uh, only, uh, there's only two uncles. Uh, my one uncle left. All the other uncles have, have passed away. And what they would do is they would help each other build a house. They were Italians, of course, and Italians knew how to do it. I don't, have you ever noticed Italians know how to do everything? I don't know what happened to me, but, but my uncles could do everything. So they, what they would do is they'd build one house for each other. Then they'd go to the other house and build the other person's house. They would help each other. They would work together, and they made themselves successful because they helped build each other. And that's what we're called to do, to help each other, okay? So sincerely, brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you've been born again. So what happens is when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are born again. You are a baby. You are birthed into the spiritual realm. Whether you're 85 years old, a retired executive of IBM, or you are a schoolhouse janitor at 65, or you are a child at 8 or a teenager at 15, you all are babies, whether you are successful in the world or not. All of us come into the world as new believers, as babies. And we need to grow, okay? You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable. So what God has given us, he, listen, this is what's so interesting. The Bible, the Bible says, as I'm perishing externally, I am getting stronger internally. And that's what we want to do. Through living and abiding word of God, all flesh is like grass, and it's glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Have you noticed that, that the skin is not as elastic as it used to be? Have you noticed that gravity takes over everything? Let's stop ahead. Let's move forward. (laughs) But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So it's the word of the Lord that lasts forever. In other words, God's ways last, man's ways pass. God's ways last man's ways pass. And if you want to live your life on the temporary, if you want to build sand castles in your life where the tide comes in and the run, uh, where the, the waves come in, or do you want to build something that will last beyond you? I don't know about you, but I want to build something that will last beyond me. And that's a life worth living. So, he says, put away. Here comes chapter 2. We're starting chapter 2 now of 1 Peter. So, put away all malice. You know what malice is? Not Alice. Malice. Malice is when somebody uh, gets a job promotion and they shouldn't have gotten it. You should have gotten it. And, and so when they leave the room, you're going to make sure you tell everyone in the break room or the Zoom room now. We don't have break rooms anymore. Now we have Zoom rooms. Private room. Yeah. They should not get that promotion. It should have been me or you. Or, or someone, so, oh, did you hear about, did you hear about, uh, did you hear about Susan John's child? What? He's in juvenile hall. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, you, you are starting to rejoice at someone else's demise. This, this couple that has it all together on Facebook, right? I mean, everything. They never have a bad angle. I mean, every, every tooth is polished. I mean, every hair is in place. I mean, every restaurant they go to is incredible. They're home. They're always doing improvements. Every time you turn it on, they put another addition on the house. And you're like, oh. And then you hear they're going through a divorce. Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. (laughs) I mean, that's malice. Now, you guys are awfully quiet because you must be guilty of this. All right? 
So put away all malice and deceit. So that's what malice would be. Deceit is obvious. Lying, not being truthful, right? Lying about things. And by the way, April 15th is coming. And hypocrisy. You know what hypocrisy is in the, in the ancient Roman um, theater and Greek theater? What they would do, they have four or five actors there, and they'd have an amphitheater. Or, or, and what they would do is they'd have these masks. And so you might have five actors uh, or might have one actor doing five or six different characters. So what they would do, they would go behind, they would chain a mask, they put a different mask on and act a different character. That's what hypocrisy is. That's the root word for hypocrisy. It's putting on a mask, being something you're not. Now, we don't do that at church, do we? Oh, of course not. You, you, know, you, 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 almost, you almost killed your children on the way to church today, and you're going, hey, you don't praise the Lord, we're doing great. Hallelujah. When people say this, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord, I go, something happened today on the way to church. <laughs> right? You know, where you put on a mask. You, you say, you know, and you really can't get better when you put on your mask. I'm not saying you walk around and be fake. Or be too real, but there comes a point where you have to take away your mask and be real. Not being a hypocrite, being real with each other. I don't know about you, but I, I'm not a big fan of hypocrisy because I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> I can be at times. Now, a hypocrite is not failing in doing something when you're trying. That's different. If you are a believer that's trying to do the right thing and you're struggling, it doesn't mean you're a hypocrite. It means you're struggling. What a hypocrite is is when you try to you try to fake it and you try to present an image that you're not. And trying to fool somebody. And some of, maybe some of you are one way at church, one way at home, one way with the boys, one way with the girls. I don't know. And you're not the real person. It says, put that away. Because you know what happens when you're, when, you have, when you're a hypocrite? When you have a mask on, you sometimes you forget what mask you have. And you start contradicting yourself. And life gets complicated. And you have to lie to cover the other mask. And life becomes complicated. Isn't it a lot better just to be real? So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy. Okay, we know what envy is, right? I don't think ever in the human condition have we ever been more tempted to envy somebody than we have now. Thanks be to social media. Right? We talked about this. Everyone's having an amazing life except for you. <laughs> right? I mean, I just saw the other day, one of my friends, he showed a side shot. He was like this. And now he's like skinny as a rail. And he's got muscles, has a V-shape. And I'm saying, I got a bell shape. He's got a V-shape. <laughs> okay. And you start looking. And you can start feeling I'm not any good. And just be, you, oh, we, we, just did, we just did a great thing. We went on vacation. We, we finally went skiing at, at Mount Southington. And someone's in the Swiss Alps. You know, so this is what begins to happen. And it's very easy to envy somebody and envy different people and envy what's going on. So put the, all that stuff, by the way, it's horrible. It makes you bitter inside. It gives you a turning in your stomach. You start becoming sarcastic and, and destitute and angry and everyone gets, it's not fair. And the next thing you know, you start blowing up everyone you're driving your car. Start screaming at the TV, all right? So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Slander is saying something about someone else to knock them down. It's gossip with a twist to kill and hurt. Now, what does he want us to do? Instead, like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk. Have you ever seen a baby? I mean, all the baby wants is one thing. It wants mama and it wants mama now. And it wants the milk. It wants the milk right now, and that's all it cares about. And the baby will do is will just get that milk, and that's all it wants. And if you try to give the, the baby uh, a T-bone steak and you try to grind it up and, and make it a liquid, it won't work. He'll, what he'll do is he'll, he'll throw it back at you. I remember Luke, I gave Luke a banana one time, and he threw it back at me. To this day, he doesn't like bananas. And so what we see happening is newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk. We are to long. We are, when you give your life to Christ, you're like a baby. Look at your look at neighbor and say, you're a baby. Okay? Now you say, so are you. All right. And you at home as well. Go ahead. All right. So newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up. You see, God wants us to grow up by having pure, pure, pure spiritual milk. Now, there's something about this passage that's a little problem here. He's basically calling these people babies. He's saying, you guys need to grow up. 
Now, I don't know, that's kind of insulting. That you may grow up into salvation, and indeed, if you have tasted that the Lord is good. So we're going to talk today about how not to be a baby anymore. How many are excited about that? All right, here we go. For in Hebrews, the author says this, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. So basically it's saying that you need to grow up and I need to grow up. Are we just milk people? Listen, if you're not ready for T-bone steaks, or I'm sorry, or tofu, uh, I don't want to insult the vegetarians here, or peas or whatever, uh, if that's what you got to have, that's fine. But you got to start off with milk. You got to start with milk and you got to breathe and you have to take in the milk in order to go to the next stage. For though it's time for you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. So when Peter's talking about milk, he's talking the same, the contemporaries. It was not an uncommon phrase in the Greek culture, in the Jewish culture to say, well, that person's still on milk. Basically saying, they need to grow up. How's your son? Oh, he's still on milk. How old is he? 50. <laughs> okay. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the what? Word of righteousness, since he is a child. So what it is, is your son, and there's nothing wrong with it initially. It's cute. Babies are cute when they're babies. So what a baby will do is the baby needs to rely on somebody else to meet its needs. That's what happens, okay? That's a baby, by the way, in case you didn't realize, okay? And, and what a baby has to do, it has to submit itself to the process, and it has to go ahead and let itself be fed. And, and 1 Corinthians 3.1, the apostle Paul also talks about milk. This is what he says. And brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Now, he was not calling them babes like I used to call babes. No, no, my wife's a babe. He's talking about babes, like babies, okay? So, okay, very well. Thank you. Uh, as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So he's talking about this. And by the way, he's, he wrote this uh, letter about five years past from his first visit. So this is his second. This is a letter to the Corinthian church five years after. So by this time, after five years, they should have been more mature in the Lord. So I would say... I think five years in the Lord, you should be a lot more mature. We've made the mistake. I've made the mistake of someone that just gave their life to Jesus Christ. They had a lot of talent. They had a lot of ability, but they were still babies. And just because they didn't look like a baby, we put them in a position of authority, and it was disastrous because they had not been tested. It takes a while, and that's okay. All right? I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but babes in Christ. I fed you with milk. See? There we are again. Milk, and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you're still not able. Hey, guys, come on. He's basically saying, grow up. So this is not exactly a good, feel-good sermon. Oh, great. You guys need to grow up because we all need to grow up. It says, it continues to go on, for you are still carnal, which means you're still being controlled by your impulses. It's called impulse control. I have an impulse to eat. I have an impulse to be angry. I have an impulse to do this. I must do this impulse right now. It's called impulse control. And they don't have impulse control. They have to go to the bathroom. What do they do? They go to the, don't say it. Okay, they go to the bathroom, right? They have to learn to stop. And, 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 and potty training is a lot of fun, everybody. Isn't it, everybody? I got the mattresses to prove it. Okay, it's a lot of fun. It can be very frustrating because Johnny doesn't want to wait. He's playing video games. He decides to go right there. Okay? And so what is it? You have to, you're still carnal for you were, for where there's envy, strife, and divisions. If there's envy and there's strife and divisions, guess what happens? There's babies around. There are babies around among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am a Paul, I am a Paulus, I believe in this, I believe in that. Now, 2020 has been a very interesting year, and I'm not going to give any examples of how people have divided over things that really don't matter. I'm not going to mention any of them right now. I promise. Okay? But it's pretty obvious. What? Fighting and dividing over things that, frankly, do not matter. And this is what we see happening with babies. It's a cage fight. 
right? When we, if this starts happening in church, you know there's a problem. That's our nursery, by the way, so <laughs> we're taking bets. I'm just kidding. All right, let's move forward. Okay. I want to talk about now stages of growth, maturity, how we all grow up. Okay? Now, aren't you glad you came to church today? You get to hear how to, you're babies, and you need to grow up. Now, thank you so much. I'm, I am too sometimes. Okay, 1 John 2.12 says this. And what, what uh, John, contemporary of Peter, one of the top three closest disciples of Jesus, James, Peter, and John, he's using milk as well. And he tells us the stages that you and I need to grow up in, all right? You're going to see it right here. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is among from the beginning, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. So he's writing to three great basic groups of believers. The first one is the children. The second one is the young men and one woman. And the third group is the Father. These are the three stages of spiritual growth. Now, obviously, there's not a, a, a clean cut line, but this is the process, just like in the natural. There are babies, right? Then there comes toddlers, then there comes teenagers, praise God. Then we go to young adults. Then we go to older adults. This is what begins to happen. So the stages of growth. There's babies, those are children. Then you have adolescents, all right? And then you have fathers and mothers. The, the goal here is to get mature, to be like a father and mother, not like this. And there's a lot written in the Bible about babies. A lot. A little bit about adolescence. Very little is written about fathers and mothers. Because it's not a problem that they face. You can see it throughout Scripture. Okay, so let's talk about babies. Let's talk about children. What is that all about? Babies, children, in the first stage, you have to know your sins are forgiven. Until a baby knows its sins are... If you give your life to Christ, you're born again. You have to know you did not earn your salvation. It was earned for you. Until you know that, you're still a baby. I don't feel like I'm a very good person. And uh, Does God still love me? And listen, if you ask Christ to forgive you, he has forgiven you. So stop beating yourself up. Yes, you're forgiven. You're saved by grace, right? Not by works, lest any man can boast. So baby, in the first stage, you have to know your sins are forgiven. And you're never going to get past that point. If you keep walking around saying, I'm no good. Daddy doesn't love me. Mommy doesn't love me. I'm no good. You're never going to grow. You have to realize, and by the way, know you're loved and accepted by God, not based upon what you've did on your own, but what you've submitted yourself to is all about that. So here's some signs of being babies. Sensitive to criticism. If someone can't tell you anything, you know anyone like that? See, show of hands. Anyone know people like that cannot take criticism? Yeah, boy, you got, I want to live your life. You don't know anyone that doesn't like criticism? Okay. Now, if, if you raised your hand, that's good. You're being honest. Congratulations. Okay. Signs of being babies, sensitive to criticism. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time someone gave you a constructive criticism. Of course, every criticism, if you think every criticism is destructive, there's a problem. When's the last time someone gave you a criticism? Well, that's great. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You must not be, oh, you must be married. No, you're not married. Okay. All right. <laughs> if someone has not given you criticism in a long time, could it be maybe that you can't receive it? Yeah, Right? So can you take criticism? Sensitive to criticism. If someone says something, you fly off the hand. How about this? Self-absorbed. It's all about me. Everything's about me. I come to church. I, I like it this way. I like it that way. I don't think it's right. I remember there was a woman in our church a number of years ago. None of, none of this. I was a kid. And we started having church where we started putting the hymn books away and started putting things on the wall. And people got upset. They said, I don't want to go to a church where it's off the wall. And what we do, we have these things called transparencies, overhead projectors. If you don't know what that is, it's like cassettes. It, they don't exist anymore. Anyhow, you take this transparency and you put the lyrics on the wall or the scripture on the wall. And someone got upset about it. This woman said, I don't like the music you're playing. I want more hymns. And so we, uh, we spoke to her. I think, uh, someone in our church spoke to the lady and said, listen, um, you like your grandson? Yes. Does your grandson come? Do you want your grandson to become a Christian? Yes. Well, why not we play some music that your grandson might like? Oh, praise. Okay, go ahead. Change the music then. She began to see it wasn't just about her. If I had service the way I wanted to have service, 
We'd have two and a half hours of worship with electric guitars. Okay? Then I'd preach for about three hours. We'd have espresso bars constantly serving you and pizza. Okay? That would be church for me. All right? And cannolis. Leave the gun and take the cannolis. Anyhow, that's from an old movie. Okay. But no, that's not what it's about. Okay? It isn't about what I want. I want to be able to serve other people. I want to be a blessing to other people. So should you. So don't be self-absorbed. Sensitive to criticism. So, some say, some of you are saying you're describing my spouse. Okay. How about this one? Emotions rule the decisions. Everything's based upon how I feel. I feel I, and up and down. God loves me. No, he doesn't love me. God doesn't love me. I went through a period in my life where God had to pull away a lot of things from me, where I had to learn to walk not by emotions, but to walk by faith. Even if I was down, even if I was going through a hard time, I had to believe God's word's true, whether I feel it or not. So sensitive to criticism, self-absorbed, emotions rule decisions. These are the things that are happening. You are babies until you understand the difference between grace and works. God gives you grace to do the right thing. Here's another one. Then we have the second stage would be this. It'd be adolescence. What's that? That's when you become a, a young adult, a teenager, if you will. And a little knowledge is a little dangerous. Uh, how many people know people this way where they get, I was this way. I, at 22 years old, I thought I knew everything. I was an expert in every field. I had an opinion on everything. And I would tell you what I thought, whether you wanted to hear it or not. And I knew everything. Because I went to school, I went to college, I have a degree. So I'm going to give you the third degree, because I have a degree. So I knew it all. I went to school, and I was a fool. <laughs> okay. So this adolescence a little bit, you start, you start you know, knowing a little more, and, and this is what can be happens. And often the adolescents criticize the babies. Oh, they're, such, they're baby Christians. We're more mature than they are. We're more mature than they are. So how do you break out of adolescence? Well, you begin to mistrust your own motives. When you start growing up, you're like, man, I don't think I can trust my own motives. I gotta, I gotta ask God why. Or you become more dependent upon God. You're learning. Wait a minute, I need to trust God for this situation. I cannot do it on my own. And, and you realize that life is not about you. You are not the central figure in a theatrical production where the world is a cast members and you are the main person. It's all about me. When you be, realize that life's not about you, you're really starting to grow up. And life is tough, and life is not fair. Oh, God must not love anymore. No, it's called this planet. In this world, Jesus said, you will have trouble. When you realize that if this is not heaven, yes, guys, things are not always going to go right. All right? It's not all about you. And we have to learn to depend on God. That's when you start really growing up. And then we get to the next stage. It's this. Fathers and mothers, this is the stage we want to be at. This is the stage where no longer is it about every, you, you, you. And by the way, when you live for you, you'll never be satisfied. Because we're not designed to be selfish. Being selfish is like being on narcotics. Being selfish is like being an alcoholic. There's never enough booze. There's never enough high. I always need more. You become an addict to yourself. It is a, it is a frivolous and a crazy thing to go after. But when you finally realize the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. Wait, and then you know what I'm talking about. You ever do something for somebody and there's no strings attached and no one knows about it? How does it make you feel? Good, right? You're so selfish. You do it for the wrong reason. No, I'm not just kidding. No, seriously. Why does it feel good? Because you're made to be like God. God gives. And when you give, when I, when I come and meet you and I'm not expecting anything in return, you can't disappoint me. What a wonderful thing. So we have fathers and mothers. And what's this all about? Fathers and mothers in the faith start to learn the disciplines of prayer, communing with him, so you regularly have you are seeing his glory. In other words, you learn how to read the Bible for yourself. You learn how to pray for yourself. You don't need us to cut up the meat for you. Listen, as much as I love you coming to church, and I'm glad we come to church, I would be a lot better off if you could learn to read the Bible for yourself. Learn to cook your own meal. Learn to eat. When you come to church on Sunday, church becomes like gravy. It's, it's great. It's wonderful. It's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. But my growth is coming from my daily time with God. I know how to feed myself. Now, if you're not there yet, it's okay. 
But this is where we want to be. This is my dream that this church become more and more this way so all of you would help each other out and we would all grow together. You'd be like my uncles helping each other build a house. Well, they help each other build their homes and build their lives. So we have babies, adolescents, and fathers and mothers. You know what? Apostle Paul says this, and this is to be our goal. My little children, of whom I again am in anguish. And any, how many parents could relate to this verse? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my Lord. All right. My little children, for whom I am in, in, the, in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. That's our objective, that Christ is formed in you, not that you just fill the seats. That, I mean, as much as it might make a pastor feel good, that doesn't really accomplish it. Our, our hope and our dream is that I grow and you grow. We all grow until Christ is formed in you. Until you come. Look what I found today. This is what we want to see. So this is what God wants us to be. We must become less childish and become more childlike. Jesus says, unless you become like little children, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus was very childlike but he wasn't childish. A child trusts its parents. Do you trust God? Are we getting to the place where we trust God, what he says, what he says, what he tells us to do? I'm going to trust God and everything I have, but I'm not going to be childish. One of the things I love, I don't know what happens when the hormones start kicking in, uh, but man, you know what I'm talking about before, the, before they become teen? I, I love teenagers. Don't get me wrong. I'm not picking on teenagers. But... <laughs> There's something about kids. They're so innocent, right? It's just kind of cool. And then all of a sudden they become teenagers. We start being, why does it change? Why can't we be like little children? Trust. This is what God would want us to be like. We can be more, like, more childlike instead of being childish. And Jesus, I did nothing unless he saw the Father doing it. Now, how do we grow? And I know this is going to make you like, oh, here we go again. He's going to talk about the same thing. Listen, everybody, I'm telling you right now, it's not the profound things that trip us up. It's the simple things that trip us up. They're so simple that we take them for granted. We take our families for granted. We take our food for granted. We take this building for granted. We take the fact that we can meet in this country for granted. One of the ways you and I grow up is start being thankful for what you have. And then he'll give you more. So how do we do it? Daily meeting with God through the Bible and prayer. You have to go after the word of God. Oh, come on. What does that mean? I don't even know how to do it. You see, I like what Charles Spurgeon said. He said this. No one ever outgrows scripture. The book widens and deepens with our years. I'm telling you right now, I, the more I know God, the more I realize I need God. The more I, I love God, the more patience I have with everybody because I realize that I need God. And when, when, when I hear Christians go, oh, they're just baby Christians, we're mature. When I hear that, that means they're adolescents. True fathers and mothers want to see people grow up. Teenagers and adolescents compare and think they know it all. I have met some of the most wonderful and the most mature people that, I, that I've had the privilege of meeting. I met Richard Wormwood, who was tortured for Christ. I've met... Uh, Dr. Jack Hayford, I spent four weeks with him with 45 other pastors. Guy's like 85, almost 90 years old now. And he's, he's all about God. He doesn't care about himself. And when you meet this guy, he, he, he was sharing with us. He's a backslidden. Oh, no, another, another leader has fallen. And he talked about how he's not been spending time with the Lord, and he's been getting preoccupied with other things. And it really broke his heart because he saw his family, was, his grandkids were, were kind of falling away a little bit, and he felt like he needed to pray more. But he didn't do it out of legalism. He did it because he realized his affections were being misplaced. It was such a pure a pure heart where someone wants to you to do well. They, they, they want you to succeed. They don't care if they get the credit anymore. What would happen if we were a people who didn't care who got the credit? We just want to help each other. I want to be wonderful. We stop competing and we start completing. That's what spiritual parents, mothers, and fathers do. You see, an amazing thing about the Bible, it's amazing. This is done by, um, back to the Bible, did a survey. 400,000 people they surveyed. And the effect they had reading the Bible. If people read the Bible once a week, eh. It helps, it doesn't really help that much. Twice a week, a little bit more. Three times, it's almost like exercise, by the way. You really don't start seeing results in exercise until you can do about four days a week. I'm telling you. 
If you go like twice a week, three times a week, when you start going four times a week, you get muscle mass, as you can tell, and uh, <laughs> you start really seeing results. Same with the Bible. What's often true in the natural is true in the spiritual. So you read the Bible once a week, and eh, it's okay. Twice a week, okay. Three times a week, a little bit better. Four times a week, they don't know why, but something happens when it's four times a week. This is what they found. 407% increase more to memorize scripture. 228% more to share their faith with others. Why? It's a natural outcrow because you're spending time with the word. 59% less likely to view pornography or get involved with promiscuous things. 30% less to struggle with loneliness. Now you'd think maybe, why don't we just have people read the Bible and not see the doctor? Now I'm not suggesting for a moment you don't see the doctor, you don't go to a counselor, but why not do this as well? Why not see, taste, and see that the Lord is good? I'm telling you right now, with all sincerity, my growth has come, not from seminary. My growth has come from my daily time with the Lord. Well, you're the pastor. We expect you to do that. I understand that. But you're all expected to do that, and not because you have to. You get to. It's so nice to begin. Let me tell you what happens right now. It happened to me yesterday. I made the mistake. I got up in the morning. It was Saturday. I don't even look out of here. Okay, let me see what's going on the weather. And then something popped up. And what did I do? I went down the rabbit trail. And the next thing you know, I'm looking at stuff on the news, this person, the other person. I start reading text messages that are nasty and all that. And I'm off. And I'm feeling stressed out. I'm agitated. I'm irritated. I get up. I'm in a bad mood. But you know what I found to do? I just turned this stinking thing off and let me first get my cup of coffee Praise the Lord. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by caffeine. The Bible of God says that, and First, first Bucci 3.17 says that. But what I'll do is I'll go down to my basement, and I'll go down, and I'll go to my car or whatever, and I'll just quiet myself. Lord, open my eyes. I'm reading through the Bible in the year. I take my time. I underline. I write down. I don't read to get check the box. I read to meet with God. If, I'm just, if I start, okay, I'm trying to check the box. Let me stop right here. If I don't finish right now, I'll do it later on. Um, I want to meet with God. And I'm telling you right now, it's that time with the Lord that I've spent with him. It's with, I didn't want to have children. I didn't. One day in, in, in my reading the word, I thought the Lord said, it's time to have kids. My, 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 my whole thing changed. I want to have kids all of a sudden. It was fun. Uh, the second thing that began to happen, I remember saying, I don't, I don't, I don't know, God. I don't, I don't think we can build. God says, it's time to build. I don't want to It's time to build. God changed my heart. I mean, Almost everything that I've ever seen, major transitions in my life, have not come from conferences, have not come from church services, have come when I'm alone with God, spending time with Him, not looking for anything but spending time with Him. I'm not going to have devotion so I can get a sermon for you guys. No, I want it to go just for me. And when I spend time with the Lord, I'm telling you, it's powerful. The Word of God is sharp. It's powerful. It will change you. And I'm telling you, it works. But I don't know how to read the Bible. Listen, if you don't know how to read the Bible, start in the New Testament. Take 10 minutes a day. Okay, we can talk more about that later. But this is what the Word of God says. All Scripture is breathed out by God, is profitable to teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is training in righteousness. And it's not like it's going to make you feel bad. No, it's going to help you come back to your normal design. It might be difficult at first. But once you get your design to your original, when you go back to a manufacturer's design, you start firing on all cylinders. And there's a joy, there's a solidarity, there's a peace. I'm not worried about stuff like I used to be. Okay? Why? It's, it's for teaching, reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be complete. Do you want to be complete and equipped? I do. Well, the Bible of God says it will do it. Every good work. For the word of God is living, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces the divisions of soul and spirit. What is this supposed to mean? This helps me realize, God, is this me or is this the circumstances? Of joints and marrow and discerning of thoughts and intentions of the heart. And what it does is I often, I'll go to the Lord. I'm going to tell you, my biggest, you know what the biggest uh, catalyst for growth for me is? Irritation. When I get irritated. I get irritated, angry, scared, depressed. They're wonderful. I thank God for all those emotions. <laughs> because I, all go, I go back to God. God, why am I feeling this way? Why does this person make me so sick? I want to just, mm. 
Why, God? Well, you feel like you're inferior to that person, and you feel, or you feel this person doesn't respect you, and you're insecure because you need someone to tell you how good you are. So get over yourself. Oops, okay, boom, get rid of that one. I'm telling you, when I go before the Lord and I ask him, God, check me out. Is there anything going on? When I get these negative emotions, they're wonderful opportunities to grow. So if you have someone difficult in your life, put your arm around and say, thank God for you. You're helping me grow so much in God. And stop right there. <laughs> Soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerning of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. In 2 Peter 3, 18, it says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We want to grow. How many want to grow in the grace of God? How many want to be the man and women that God has called you to become? What a play. I mean, you get accepted as a baby. And what we should be about, we should be blessing each other and helping each other. Well, how do we grow? Daily meeting with God through Bible and prayer. Okay, oh, that's so obvious, Pastor. I know it's obvious, but it gets deeper and it gets wider. And fellowship with other believers. You do not see this working without each other. The followers of Jesus' life must be seen as a process, a journey, a maturation process. And you have to go on and on. The Bible says, rather, speaking the truth in love... Me, does it say me? What does it say? We, what does we mean? Look at your neighbor, say you're a we. Okay. Rather than speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to him who's the head unto Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint by which is equipped when each part, your neighbor is an each. You are an each. Tell someone, you're an each. Make sure you pronounce it correctly. <laughs> you're going to slap across the face. All right, here we go. Joint with which is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love, that we become better together than we're by ourselves. Nowhere in the scripture do you see it just you and God alone. No, it's you and God in the body. That's why we encourage you to get involved with small groups. That's why I encourage you to get to know people. That's why I encourage you, do you have anyone in your life that can, you can be real with? You want in your life, you can take the mask off. Do you have anyone in your life that can tell you some things you don't want to hear because they care about you and because they love you? So I want to encourage you that today. And ask you, just for a moment, just take a moment right now. Let me ask you, how are you today with the Lord? I can I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment? How many would say today, I'm tired of being a baby? My whole life's about me. My whole life's about me. It's all about what I want. People are not meeting my needs. And you feel like you're held hostage to your emotions. I don't know how many of you are feeling that way right now. Or maybe you've been stuck in the same pattern all your, for the last five months, five years, and you realize that you're like a baby, and you're tired of being that way. You, you want to move on from that. God wants to grow you because he loves you. He wants to see you flourish. It's time to put away childish ways. It's time to grow up, everybody. It's time to submit ourselves to God and submit ourselves to each other in love. It's time for us to, for those of us that are a little further along the road, we don't want to look down on each other. We want to help each other out. We want to grow and become the people that God's called us to be. So, Lord God, I, we confess today, Lord, that many of us, myself included, we're tired of being immature babies where it's all about me they don't, they don't, Lord. I don't care anymore, Lord. We want to be free of that. We want to be free to, to accept your forgiveness and free to give it away. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>